Well, hello, and welcome back to day 11 of the 12 Days of Craft Lit. I told you yesterday that today's text doesn't show up in the ballet, but I will tell you that the fight and the end of the ballet made a lot more sense to me after listening to this part of the story. When we left Maria, she'd been wounded in the battle. She'd had the glass removed from her arm. She was not feeling well. And Drosselmeyer tells her a story to divert her attention. This is that story. So first off, Maria really did get wounded in dream battle, which is kind of cool because then maybe it's not all a dream. And Drosselmeyer does some interesting stuff uh, narratively. He inserts himself into this story too. So you have uncle, counselor, clockmaker, Drosselmeyer. And then in the story, you have mechanist, Christian Elias Drosselmeyer of Nuremberg. And then inside the story, you will meet, inside, inside the story, you will meet puppet maker, varnisher, gilder, Christopher Zacharias Drosselmeyer. It starts to feel like a Russian novel, right? Who has a son also named Drosselmeyer. It all works out in the end, I promise. All right, so let's take a listen to Drosselmeyer's story that he tells to Give Maria something to listen to while she rehabilitates. Here we go. Chapter 7 The Story of the Hard Nut Pearly Pat's mother was the wife of a king, and therefore a queen, and Pearly Pat, straightway at the moment of her birth, a true princess. The king was beside himself with joy when he saw his beautiful daughter as she lay in the cradle. He shouted aloud, danced, jumped about upon one leg, and cried again and again, Ha ha! Was there ever anything seen more beautiful than my little pearly pat? Thereupon, all the ministers, generals, presidents, and staff officers jumped about upon one leg like the king, and cried aloud, No! Never! And it was so in truth. For as long as the world has been standing, a lovelier child was never born than this very Princess Pearlypat. Her little face seemed made of lilies and roses, delicate white and red. Her eyes were of living sparkling azure, and it was charming to see how her little locks curled in bright golden ringlets. Besides this, Pearly Pat had brought into the world two rows of little pearly teeth, with which two hours after her birth she bit the High Chancellor's finger as he was examining her features too closely, so that he screamed out, Oh, Gemini! Others assert that he screamed out, Oh, Cricky! But on this point authorities are at the present day divided. Well, Little Pearly Pat bit the High Chancellor's finger, and the enraptured land knew now that some sense dwelt in Pearly Pat's beautiful body. As has been said, all were delighted. The Queen alone was very anxious and uneasy, and no one knew wherefore, but everybody remarked with surprise the care with which she watched Pearly Pat's cradle. Besides that, The doors were guarded by soldiers, and not counting the two nurses, who always remained close by the cradle, six maids night after night sat in the room to watch. But what seemed very foolish, and no one could understand the meaning of it, was this. Each of these six maids must have a cat upon her lap, and stroke it the whole night through, and thus keep it continually purring. It is impossible that you, dear children, can guess why Pearly Pat's mother made all these arrangements, but I know and will straightway tell you. It happened that once upon a time many great kings and fine princes were assembled at the court of Pearly Pat's father, on which occasion much splendour was displayed. The theatres were crowded, balls were given, and tournaments held almost every day. 
The king, in order to show plainly that he was in no want of gold and silver, was resolved to take a good handful out of his royal treasury and expend it in a suitable manner. Therefore, as soon as he had been privately informed by the overseer of the kitchen that the court astronomer had predicted the right time for killing, he ordered a great feast of sausages, leaped into his carriage and went himself to invite the assembled kings and princes to take a little soup with him in order to enjoy the agreeable surprise which he had prepared for them. Upon his return, he said very affectionately to the queen, You know, my dear, how extremely fond I am of sausages. The queen knew at once what he meant by that, and it was this, that she should take upon herself, as she had often done before, the useful occupation of making sausages. The Lord Treasurer must straightway bring to the kitchen the great golden sausage kettle, and the silver chopping knives and stew pans. A large fire of sandalwood was made, the queen put on her damask apron, and soon the sweet smell of the sausage meat began to steam up out of the kettle. The agreeable odour penetrated even to the royal council chamber, and the king, seized with a sudden transport, could no longer restrain himself. With your permission, my lords, he cried, and leaped up, ran as fast as he could into the kitchen, embraced the queen, stirred a little with his golden scepter in the kettle, and then his emotion, being quieted, returned calmly to the council. The important moment had now arrived, when the fat was to be chopped into little pieces, and browned gently in the silver stew pans. The maids of honour now retired, for the queen, out of true devotion and reverence for her royal spouse, wished to perform this duty alone. But just as the fat began to fry, a small, whimpering, whispering voice was heard. Give me a little of the fat, sister. I should like my part of the feast. I too am a queen. Give me a little of the fat. The queen knew very well that it was Lady Mouserings who said this. Lady Mouserings had lived these many years in the king's palace. She maintained that she was related to the royal family and that she was herself a queen in the kingdom of Mausalia, for which reason she held a great court under the hearth. The queen was a kind and benevolent lady, and although she was not exactly willing to acknowledge Lady Mouserings as a true queen and sister, yet she was very ready to allow her a little banquet on this great holiday. She answered, therefore, Come out then, Lady Mouserings, you are welcome to a little of the fat. Upon this, Lady Mouserings leaped out very quickly and merrily, jumped upon the hearth and seized, with her dainty little paws, one piece of fat after the other as the queen reached it to her. But now all the cousins and aunts of the Lady Mouserings came running out, besides her seven sons, rude and forward rogues, who all fell at once upon the fat, and the terrified queen could not drive them away. But as good fortune would have it, the chief maid of honour came in at this moment and chased away the intruding guests so that a little of the fat was left. The king's mathematician being summoned demonstrated very clearly that there was enough remaining to season all the sausages if distributed with the nicest judgment and skill. Drums and trumpets were now heard without, and all the invited potentates and princes, some on white palfreys, some in crystal carriages, came in splendid apparel to the sausage feast. The king received them kindly and graciously, and then adorned with crown and scepter, as became the monarch of the land, seated himself at the head of the table. Already in the first course, that of the sausage balls, it was observed that he grew pale and paler, 
raised his eyes to heaven. Gentle sighs escaped from his bosom, and he seemed to undergo great inward suffering. But in the second course, which consisted of the long sausages, he sank back upon his throne, sobbing and moaning, held both hands to his face, and at last wept and groaned aloud. All sprang up from the table. The royal physician tried in vain to feel the pulse of the unhappy monarch. A deep-seated, unknown torture appeared to agitate him. At last, after much anxiety, and after the application of some very strong remedies, the king seemed to come a little to himself, and stammered out scarce audibly the words. Two little fat. Then the queen threw herself in despair at his feet and sobbed out, Oh, my poor unhappy royal husband, alas, how great must be the suffering which you endure. But see the guilty one at your feet, punish, punish her without mercy. Alas, Lady Mouserings with her seven sons and aunts and cousins have eaten up the fat and... With these words, she fell right over backwards in a swoon. Then the king, full of rage, leaped up and cried out, Chief maid of honour, how happened that? The chief maid of honour told the story as much as she knew of it, and the king resolved to take vengeance upon Lady Mouserings and her family for having eaten up the fat of his sausages. The Privy Council was called, and it was resolved to summon Lady Mouserings to trial and confiscate all her estates. But as the king was of opinion that in the meanwhile she might eat up more of his sausage fat, the affair was placed at last in the hands of the royal watchmaker and mechanist. This man, whose name was the same as mine to wit, Christian Elias Drosselmeyer engaged, by means of a very singular and deep political scheme, to drive Lady Mouserings and her family from the palace forever. He invented, therefore, several curious little machines, in which a piece of toasted fat was fastened to a thread, and these Drosselmeyer placed around Lady Mouserings' dwelling. Lady Mouserings was much too wise not to see through Drosselmeyer's craft, but all her warnings, all her entreaties were of no avail. Every one of her seven sons, and many of her cousins and aunts, went into Drosselmeyer's machines, and, as they tried to snap away the fat, were caught by an iron grating, which fell suddenly down behind them, and were afterwards miserably slaughtered in the kitchen. Lady Mouserings, with the little remnant of her family, forsook the dreadful place. Grief, despair, revenge filled her bosom. The court revelled in joy at this event, but the queen was very anxious, for she knew the disposition of Lady Mouserings, and was very sure that she would not suffer the death of her sons to go unavenged. In fact, Lady Mouserings appeared one day, when the queen was in the kitchen, preparing a haslet hash for her royal husband, a dish of which he was very fond, and said, my sons, my cousins and aunts are destroyed. Take care, queen, that Mouse Queen does not bite thy little princess in two. Take good care. With this she disappeared and was not seen again. But the queen was so frightened that she let the hash fall into the fire, and thus a second time Lady Mousering spoiled a favourite dish for the king at which he was very angry. But this, dear children, said Drosselmeyer, is enough for tonight, the rest at another time. Maria, who had her own thoughts about this story, begged Godfather Drosselmeyer very hard to go on, but 
she could not prevail upon him. He rose, saying, Too much at once is bad for the health, the rest tomorrow. As the counsellor was just stepping out of the room, Fred called out, Tell me, Godfather Drosselmeyer, is it then really true that you invented mouse traps? How can you ask such a silly question? said his mother. But the counsellor smiled mysteriously and said in an undertone, Am I a skillful watchmaker and yet not able to invent a mouse trap? End of chapter 7. Chapter 8 The Story of the Hard Nut Continued. You know now, children, commenced Councillor Drosselmeyer on the following evening, why the Queen took such care in guarding the beautiful Princess Pearlypat. Was it not to be feared that Lady Mouserings would execute her threat, that she would come again and bite the little princess to death? Drosselmeyer's machines were not the least protection against the wise and prudent Lady Mouserings, but the court astronomer, who was at the same time private stargazer and fortune-teller to his majesty, declared it to be his opinion that the family of Baron Purr would be able to keep Lady Mouserings from the cradle. Most of that name were secretaries of legation at court, with little to do, though always at hand for an embassy to a foreign power. But they must now render themselves useful at home, and thus it came that each of the waiting women must hold a son of that family upon her lap, and by continual and attentive fondling, lighten the severe public duties which fell to their lot. Late one night the two chief nurses who sat close by the cradle started up out of a deep sleep. All around lay in quiet slumber, no purring, the stillness of the grave. Even the death watch could be heard ticking. And what was the terror of the two chief waiting women as they just saw before them a large, dreadful mouse, which stood erect upon its hind feet, and had laid its ugly head close against the face of the princess. With a cry of terror they jumped up, all awoke, but in a moment Lady Mouserings, for the great mouse by Pearly Pat's cradle was no one but she, ran as fast as she could to the corner of the chamber. The secretaries of legation leaped after her, but too late, she had disappeared through a hole in the chamber floor. Little Pearly Pat awoke at the noise and wept bitterly. Thank heaven, cried the nurse. She lives, she lives. But how great was their terror when they looked at Pearly Pat and saw what a change had taken place in the sweet, beautiful child. Instead of the white and red face with golden locks, a large, ill-shaped head sat upon her thin, shriveled body. Her azure blue eyes were changed into green staring ones, and her little mouth had stretched itself from ear to ear. The queen was brought to death's door by grief and sorrow, and it was found necessary to hang the king's library with thick wadded tapestry, for again and again he ran his head against the wall, crying out at every time in lamentable tones. Ah, me, unhappy monarch! He might now have seen how much better it would have been to eat his sausages without fat and to leave Lady Mouserings and her family at peace under the hearth. But Pearly Pat's royal father did not think about all this. He laid all the blame upon the court watchmaker and mechanist, Christian Elias Drosselmeyer of Nuremberg. He therefore wisely decreed that Drosselmeyer should restore the Princess Pearly Pat to her former condition within four weeks, or at least find out some certain and infallible method of effecting this. Otherwise, he should suffer a shameful death 
under the axe of the executioner. Drosselmeyer was not a little terrified, but he had great confidence in his skill and good fortune, and began immediately the first operation which he thought useful. He took little Princess Pearlypat apart with great dexterity, unscrewed her little hands and feet, and carefully examined her inward structure. But he found, alas, that the princess would grow uglier as she grew bigger, and knew not what to do or what to advise. He put the princess carefully together again, and sank down by her cradle in despair, for he was not allowed to leave it. The fourth week had commenced, yes, Thursday had come, when the king looked in with flashing eyes, and shaking his scepter at him, cried, Christian Elias Drosselmeyer, cure the princess, or thou must die. Drosselmeyer began to weep bitterly, but the princess Pearlypat lay as happy as the day, and cracked nuts. Pearlypat's uncommon appetite for nuts now occurred for the first time to the mechanist, and the fact, likewise, that she had come into the world with teeth. In truth, immediately after her transformation, she had screamed continually until a nut accidentally came in her way, which she immediately put into her mouth, cracked it, ate the kernel, and then became quite composed. Since that time, her nurses found that nothing pleased her so well as to be supplied with nuts. Oh, sacred instinct of nature, eternal, inexplicable sympathy of existence, cried Christian Elias Drosselmeyer. Thou pointest me to the gates of this mystery. I will knock and they will open. He begged straightway for permission to speak with the royal astronomer and was led to his apartment under a strong guard. They embraced with many tears, for they had been warm friends, then retired into a private cabinet, and examined a great many books which treated of instinct, of sympathies, and antipathies, and other mysterious things. Night came on. The astronomer looked at the stars, and with the aid of Drosselmeyer, who had great skill in such matters, set up the horoscope of Princess Pearlypat. It was a great deal of trouble, for the lines grew all the while more and more intricate. But at last, what joy! At last it became clear that the Princess Pearlypat, in order to be freed from the magic which had deformed her, and to regain her beauty, had nothing to do but to eat the kernel of the nut, Krakatuk. Now the nut Krakatuk had such a hard shell that an eight-and-forty pounder might be wheeled over it without breaking it. This hard nut must be cracked with the teeth before the princess by a man who had never been shaved and had never worn boots. The young man must then hand her the kernel with closed eyes and must not open them again until he had marched seven steps backward without stumbling. Drosselmeyer and the astronomer had laboured together without cessation for three days and nights, and the king was seated at dinner on Sunday afternoon, when the mechanist, who was to have been beheaded early Monday morning, rushed in with joy and transport, and proclaimed that he had found out a method of restoring to the Princess Pearlypat her lost beauty. The king embraced him with great kindness and promised him a diamond sword, four orders of honour and two new Sunday suits. Immediately after dinner we will go to work, he added, and see to it, dear mechanist, that the unshorn young man in shoes is ready at hand with the nut, Krakatuk and take care that he drinks no wine beforehand, for fear he should stumble as he goes the seven steps backward, like a crab. Afterward, he may drink like a fish. Drosselmeyer was very much discomposed at these words, and after much stuttering and stammering, said, 
that the method was discovered indeed, but that the nut, Crackatuck, and the young man to crack it were yet to be sought after, and that it was quite doubtful whether nut or nutcracker would ever be found. The king, in great anger, swung his scepter about his crowned head and roared with the voice of a lion, Then off goes thy head! It was very fortunate for the unhappy Drosselmeyer that the king's dinner had been cooked better than usual this day, so that he was in a pleasant humour and disposed to listen to reason, while the good queen, who was moved by the hard fate of the mechanist, used her influence to soothe him. Drosselmeyer then after a while took courage and represented to the monarch that he had performed his task in discovering the means to restore the princess to her beauty and thus by the terms of the royal decree had secured his safety. The king said that was all trash, stupid stuff and nonsense, but resolved at last that the watchmaker should leave the court instantly, accompanied by the royal astronomer, and never return without the nut Crackatuck in his pocket. By the intercession of the queen, he consented that the nutcracker might be summoned by a notice in all the home and foreign newspapers and journals. Here the counsellor broke off again and promised to narrate the rest on the following evening. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 Conclusion of the Story of the Hard Nut The next evening, as soon as the candles were lighted, Godfather Drosselmeyer appeared and continued his story as follows. Drosselmeyer and the astronomer had been fifteen years on their journey without seeing the least signs of the nut, Crackatuck. It would take me a month, children, to tell where they went and what strange things happened to them. I must pass them over and commence where Drosselmeyer sank at last into despondency and felt a great desire to see his dear native city, Nuremberg. This desire came upon him all at once, as he was smoking a pipe of tobacco with his friend in the middle of a great wood in Asia. Oh, sweet city, he cried, sweet native city, sweet Nuremberg. He who has never seen thee, though he may have travelled to London, Paris, Rome, if his heart is not dead to emotion, must continually desire to visit thee. Thee, O oh Nuremberg, sweet city, where there are so many beautiful houses with windows. As Drosselmeyer grieved in such a sorrowful manner, the astronomer was moved with sympathy and began to cry and howl so pitifully that it was heard far and wide through Asia. He soon composed himself again, wiped the tears out of his eyes and said, But why, my respected colleague, why sit here and howl? Why should we not go to Nuremberg? Is it not all the same wherever we seek after this miserable nut, Crackatuck? That is true, replied Dosselmeyer, greatly consoled. Both arose, knocked out their pipes, and went straight forward out of the wood in the middle of Asia, right to Nuremberg. They had scarcely arrived there when Drosselmeyer ran to his brother, Christopher Zacharias Drosselmeyer, puppet maker, varnisher and gilder, whom he had not seen for these many years. The watchmaker told him the whole story of the Princess Pearlipat, Lady Mouserings and the nut Crackatuck so that he struck his hands together over and over again with astonishment and exclaimed, Ay, ay, brother, brother, what strange things are these? Drosselmeyer then related the history of his travels, how he had passed two years with King Date, how coldly he had been received by Prince Almond, and how he had sought information to no purpose 
of the Natural Society in Squirrelburg. In short, how his search everywhere had been in vain to find even the least signs of the nut Krakatuk. During this account, Christopher Zacharias had often snapped his fingers, turned about on one foot, winked, laughed, clucked with his tongue, and then called out, Hi, hum, I, oh, if it should. At last he tossed his hat and wig up in the air, clasped his brother round the neck and cried, Brother, brother, you are safe. Safe, I say, for I must be wonderfully mistaken if I have not that nut Krakatuk at this very moment in my possession. He then drew a little box from his pocket and took out of it a gilded nut of moderate size. See, he said, this nut fell into my hands in this way. Many years ago, a stranger came here at Christmas time with a sack full of nuts, which he offered for sale cheap. Just as he passed my shop, he got into a quarrel with a nut seller of this city, who did not like to see a stranger come hither to undersell him, and for this reason attacked him. The man put down his sack upon the ground, the better to defend himself, and at the same moment a heavily laden wagon passed directly over it. All the nuts were cracked in pieces, except this one which the stranger, with a singular smile, offered me for a bright dollar of the year 1720. I thought that strange, but as I found in my pocket just such a dollar as the man wanted, I bought the nut and gilded it over, without exactly knowing why I bought the nut so dear, or why I set so much store by it. All doubt whether this nut was actually the long-sought nut Krakatuk was instantly removed when the astronomer was called, who carefully scraped off the gold and found upon the rind the word Krakatuk, engraved in Chinese characters. The joy of the travellers was beyond bounds, and the brother the happiest man under the sun, for Drosselmeyer assured him that his fortune was made, since he would have a considerable pension for the rest of his days, and then there was the gold which had been scraped off. He might keep that for gilding. The mechanist and the astronomer had both put on their nightcaps, and were getting into bed as the latter commenced. My worthy colleague, good fortune never comes single. Take my word for it. We have found not only the nut Krakatuk, but also the young man who is to crack it and hand the colonel to the princess. I mean nobody else than your brother's son. I cannot sleep. No, this very night I must cast the youth's horoscope. With these words he threw the nightcap off his head and began straightway to take an observation. The brother's son was in truth a handsome, well-grown young man, who had never been shaved, and who had never worn boots. In his early youth, he had, on Christmas nights, gone around as a merry Andrew, but this could not be seen in his behaviour in the least. So well had his manners been formed by his father's care. On Christmas days he wore a handsome red coat trimmed with gold, a sword, a hat under his arm and a curling wig. In this fine dress he would stand in his father's shop and out of gallantry crack nuts for the young girls, for which reason he was called the handsome nutcracker. On the following morning the astronomer was in raptures he fell upon the mechanist's neck and cried, It is he! We have him! He is found! But there are two things, worthy colleague, which we must see to. In the first place, we must braid for your excellent nephew a stout wooden cue, which shall be joined in such a way to his lower jaw that it can move it with great force. In the next place... When we arrive at the king's palace, we must let no one know that we have brought the young man with us who is to crack the nut Krakatuk. It is best, 
that he should not be found for a long time. I read in his horoscope that after many young men have broken their teeth to no purpose, the king will promise to him who cracks the nut and restores to the princess her lost beauty, the princess herself, and the succession to the throne as a reward. His brother, the puppet maker, was highly delighted to think that his son might marry the princess Pearlypat and become a prince and king, and he gave him up entirely into the hands of the two travellers. The cue which Drosselmeyer fastened upon his young and hopeful nephew answered admirably, so that he made a series of the most successful experiments, even upon the hardest peach stones. As Drosselmeyer and the astronomer had sent immediate information to the palace of the discovery of the nut Krakatuk, suitable notices had been published, and when the travellers arrived, many handsome young men, and among them some handsome princes, had appeared, who, trusting to their sound teeth, were ready to undertake the disenchantment of the princess. The travellers were not a little terrified when they beheld the princess again. Her little body, with its tiny hands and feet, was hardly able to carry her great, misshapen head, and the ugliness of her face was increased by a white cotton beard, which had spread itself around her mouth and over her chin. All happened as the astronomer had read in the horoscope. One youth in shoes after another bit upon the nut Krakatuk until his teeth and jaws were sore, and as he was led away, half swooning by the physician in attendance, sighed out, that was a hard nut. When the king, in the anguish of his heart, had promised his daughter and his kingdom to him who should effect the disenchantment, the handsome young Drosselmeyer stepped forward and begged for permission to begin the experiment, and no one had pleased the fancy of Princess Pearlypat as well as young Drosselmeyer. She laid her little hand upon her heart and sighed deeply. Ah, oh, if this might be the one who is to crack the nut Krakatuk and become my husband. After young Drosselmeyer had gracefully saluted the king and queen, and then the princess Pearlypat, he received the nut Krakatuk from the hands of the master of ceremonies, put it without hesitation between his teeth, pulled his cue very hard, and crack, crack, the shell broke into many pieces. He then nicely removed the little threads and broken bits of shell that hung to the kernel, and reached it with a low bow to the princess, after which he shut his eyes and began to walk backwards. The princess straightway swallowed the kernel, and behold, her ugly shape was gone, and in its place appeared a most beautiful figure, with a face of roses and lilies, delicate white and red, eyes of living sparkling azure, and locks curling in bright golden ringlets. Drums and trumpets mingled their sounds with the loud rejoicings of the people. The king and his whole court danced as at Pearly Pat's birth upon one leg, and the queen had to be carefully tended with cologne water because she had fallen into a swoon from delight and rapture. Young Drosselmeyer, who had still his seven steps to perform, was a good deal discomposed by the tumult, but he kept firm and was just stretching back his right foot for the seventh step when Lady Mouserings rose squeaking and squealing out of the floor. Down came his foot upon her head, and he stumbled, so that he hardly kept himself from falling. Alas, what a hard fate! As quick as thought, the youth was changed to the former figure of the princess. 
his body became shriveled up and was hardly able to support his great misshapen head. His eyes turned green and staring, and his mouth was stretched from ear to ear. Instead of his cue, a narrow wooden cloak hung down upon his back, with which he moved his lower jaw. The watchmaker and astronomer were benumbed with terror and affright, while Lady Mouserings rolled bleeding and kicking upon the floor. Her malice did not go unpunished, for young Drosselmeyer had trodden upon her neck so heavily with the sharp heel of his shoe that she could not survive. When Lady Mouserings lay in her last agonies, she squeaked and whimpered in a piteous tone. Oh, crack attack, hard nut, hi, hi, of thee I now must die. K, K, son with seven crowns will bite, nut cracker at night. Hi, hi, K, K, and revenge his mother's death. Short breath must I. Hi, hi, die, die, so young. K, K, oh, agony, quick! With this cry, Lady Mouserings died, and the royal oven heater carried out her body. As for young Drosselmeyer, no one troubled himself any further about him, but the princess put the king in mind of his promise, and he commanded that they should bring the young hero before him. But when the unfortunate youth approached, the princess held both hands before her face and cried, Away, away with the ugly nutcracker. The court-martial immediately took him by the shoulders and pushed him out of doors. The king was full of anger because they had wished to give him a nutcracker for a son-in-law and he put all the blame upon the mechanist and astronomer and banished them forever from the kingdom. This did not stand in the horoscope which the astronomer had set up at Nuremberg, but he did not allow himself to be discouraged. He straightway took another observation and declared that he could read in the stars that young Drosselmeyer would conduct himself so well in his new station that in spite of his deformity he would yet become a prince and a king, and that his former beauty would return. As soon as the son of Lady Mouserings, who had been born with seven heads, after the death of her seven sons, had fallen by his hand, and a maiden had loved him, notwithstanding his ugly shape. And they say that young Drosselmeyer has actually been seen about Christmas time in his father's shop at Nuremberg as a nutcracker. It is true, but at the same time as a prince. This, children, is the story of the hard nut, and you know now why people say so often, that was a hard nut. And whence it comes that nutcrackers are so ugly. The counsellor thus concluded his narration. Maria thought that the princess Pearlypat was an ill-natured, ungrateful thing, and Fred declared that if nutcracker were anything of a man, he would not be long in settling matters with the mouse king, and would get his old shape again very soon. End of chapter 9 all right, so now the Nutcracker changing from the giant-headed live toy thing to the hot ballet prince icon. It makes sense now, right? This whole story seems very gothic to me. The magic, the curse, the ugly, and the beautiful. It's like E.T.A. Hoffman set out to write a platonic ideal of gothic tales for kids, you know, heavy enough on the gothic to be interesting and light enough on the gothic to be kid-friendly. Drosselmeyer's clockwork gift isn't appreciated by the kids at first, and I wonder if that's supposed to be how kids see the grown-up world. It's all clockwork. It's all the same thing repeated over and over again. 
For Maria, the way her world is upended is definitely not repetitive and boring, like the toys quickly became for her and her brother. She seems uh, remarkably at home in the darker, more chaotic world that she winds up in, where there is real danger and real pain. And kids know that stuff is real. This is definitely veering into Bruno Bettelheim's The Uses of Enchantment territory. So Maria's in this imaginary world where the stakes are life and death, sure. But when you are part of an all-for-one and one-for-all community, timing. No one's alone here, and no one's telling her that she's being foolish. Nobody's putting her down. They look at her and she's capable. She's capable of being valorous and brave. And, and that's kind of cool for something written so long ago. By the way, I did try to figure out the crick, crack, hi, hi stuff that's going on in the narration for these stories. And they sort of appear in the German, but not really. I think these are more Mrs. Silver's poetic license in uh, in her translation. I don't know why. That happens sometimes. What are you on the do? All right. Thank you so much for sharing the second third of The Nutcracker and the Mouse King. And tomorrow we'll finish it up for the last day of the 12 days of Craftlet. If you're listening to this in real time, I hope you have a fantastic Christmas Eve and a wonderful Christmas. Talk to you tomorrow. Take care. Bye. If you like what we do here, please consider liking and subscribing on iTunes, thumbs upping and subscribing on YouTube. You can visit patreon.com slash craftlit and become a patron of this art. And you can always go to Linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash craftlit channel. And from there, you can get links out to all of the social media, all of the places that Craftlet lives. It's, it's a nice hub that you can go to to get all the stuff, all the good stuff. And I keep forgetting to mention, we also have a Facebook group with the loveliest group of people, as you might imagine. They're just awesome. Makers and readers. And people who hadn't been readers before, but are now. I like that. All right. You take care of yourself. Have a great one. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.